Soundcast. This is a Village Soundcast Network original production. Welcome to Lends Me Your Ears. I'm Stephen Cook, arch reporter for the Chronicle Herald here in Halifax. I'm Karsten Knox, a blogger at Flaw in the Iris at halifaxbloggers.ca and the movie guru at CTV Morning Live. This is a movie podcast where we look at some current films and then examine some older titles that might be tangentially related. And hopefully you'll learn something about some films you might not have seen before. This week on Lends Me Your Ears, we're checking out the city that never sleeps, starting with a most violent year and looking back at great New York movies of yesteryear. Welcome back. We're talking this week about New York movies. And, uh, you know, first thing I thought when we started discussing New York movies is what makes a good New York movie. Yeah, it's uh, cer- certainly lots of films are set there. It's it's not always an economical thing for filmmakers to do. <laughs> it's not a cheap city to shoot in. But, uh, you know, I, I, there are certain things you need. You need that shot of the skyline, um, shot of a bridge, uh, Brooklyn, Verrazano Narrows, George Washington. They've got a lot of them to choose from. Yeah, the 59th Street, the Street Feeling Groovy Bridge. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Williamsburg. Um, you know, you need characters that talk like this. Yeah. You, know, you need lots of yeah. those kind of guys. Um, uh, and and you need something that's um, maybe got a little more punch than a typical Hollywood film. Something uh, something with some some high human drama, but also a kind of gritty underbelly to it. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think you hit it on the head. All of those, and of course, there are a certain amount of of Hollywood filmmakers that are associated with New York, uh, and and certainly the '70s. I think is a time when a lot of great New York movies were made. They they continue to be made, but that was that's the time when you think about the De Palma, Scorsese, Lumet, uh, Allen. Uh, Coppola, you know, I mean, these are people that are think, you know, they they are somehow associated with with the city, and uh, and we're going to talk about a few of those 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 men's works this this podcast. Uh, but but uh, I think we should say that the reason we came up with the idea is because a most violent year is in cinemas now, and this is a terrific film uh, from J C Chandor, uh, written and directed. And uh, I don't understand why it didn't get more attention at the Oscars this year, but there it is. It's uh, it's one that people shouldn't miss while it's still in cinemas. And uh, it's basically set in 1981. I think that's part of the, the charm of it and why we why it elicits these both the reality of the time, which I gather New York in 81 was a pretty rough place, um, but also all the other movies that were made around that time. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like the tail end of that cycle uh, we've seen through the 70s. Uh, films, you know, the the, the graffiti painted subways and and uh, trash filled streets and burned out tenements and all kind of, like I mean it's 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 um it's kind of a almost a cliche of the period, but it's true. That's what the place looked like. And and uh, so what we have here is uh, Oscar Isaac is a guy who's trying to rise above that. He's he's trying to be a self made man with this uh, heating oil company in uh, I guess they're based in Brooklyn. Um, and uh, you know he, he's trying to make something of himself he's got big ideas he wants to expand the business by um by a not a refinery but kind of like a containment uh center near the that's on the water so he can get his deliveries right to uh, his facilities and you know he he's a big dreamer uh, with big ideas, and uh, the system is kind of bringing him down in a yeah, big way. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And he, he wants to run his business legitimately, but he is it's a very corrupt business, and all his competitors are not above stealing his trucks and, and sending people to, to, to basically disrupt his business and cost him money. And uh, he's, he's really trying to be above board. Uh, his, his wife, Anna, played by Jessica Chastain, she's kind of the the um, Lady Macbeth character in this. She she's uh, a little more willing to 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 uh, to do the the rough thing and and fight back fire with fire if if need be. And so a lot of the pressure that Abel feels, the Oscar Isaac character feels, is not only from his competitors but from his own in his own household. He and his wife have just moved into this beautiful home, but but there's there are men with guns wandering around the outside and threatening you know and, and being a danger to their kids. And uh, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's really a fascinating moment because you get 
get the sense that that these upwardly mobile people are are representative of a lot of people at the time. And then then you know it's it, and it's funny because I heard an interview with Oscar Isaac recently, and he talked about how it's an anti gangster gangster movie, and that's <laughs> kind of what it's about. For yeah, sure. because it's it's this low level kind of crime. I mean, it's the heating oil business. It's not. Uh, <laughs> We're not talking uh, the olive oil business, which is you know way more violent. <laughs> yeah, there you go, uh, you know, or, or or gambling, or 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 what have you. Um, you know, it's not a business you would think of as being riddled with corruption, and yet here we are. It's 1981, and and uh, you know people are on the take, and he's got to deal with the Teamsters, and uh, you know people are hijacking his trucks, and he doesn't know who's doing it. Um, and it's you know you would you know it, it doesn't know if uh, one of his drivers is going to get beat up or shot or, or what's going to go from day to day. And then you kind of you you have this weird feeling of dread through the whole film for a guy who runs a heating oil company. It's it's an amazing achievement. I it thought is. you know this film worked for me on so many different levels, um, from the acting to the setting to all that. But uh, you know it's it just it takes us to that time and place so well. And I you know it feeds into kind of this paranoia I used to have about New York as a kid because like I grew up seeing stories about crime and stuff. I mean, I, you know, growing up in the 70s. And then finally, my family, we went to New York and actually stayed with uh, relatives in Brooklyn in like 78 or 79. And I was just convinced that, you know, gangsters were going to take us down <laughs> before we could continue on to Florida, yeah. which is our final destination. And yeah. and, and this, this perfectly captures that time that I, you know, I remember so well from my childhood. Yeah, it's funny how that that these movies, you know, created this image in your head of what the city was about. And and I actually also visited New York for the first time around 78. And my parents took me to the World Trade Center. We went up to the top to the Windows of the World restaurant. And, uh, of course, I wanted to go because cause my King Kong had climbed the World Trade <laughs> Center. Course. So that's why. I mean, I'd seen King Kong, and I was like, and that from the 70s. And, and that was the building that, they, that he climbed. And so as a result, that's why that was so epic for me. But... Uh, but yeah, there, there's there's the thing about about how New York movies, uh, you know, elicit the 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 reality of what life was like then. But uh, in this case, with a most violent year, uh, it's also telling of of New York movies in general. And I think I think there's something about Oscar Isaac who, and this has also been mentioned a number of times, how much like Al Pacino he is uh, in this film, especially. Uh, you know, he's not a big guy. Um, he has that same kind of brooding intensity, and and the fact that he is, plays a character who's trying to do the straight, the, the right thing, but keeps getting pulled back in, you know, into this 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 uh, cesspool, uh, you know, speaks to the Godfather, but it also speaks to Serpico, which uh, which I think is is a movie worth mentioning in in regards to this movie. Movie, um, you know, Sidney Lumet, 1973. Al Pacino uh, plays a cop who's who's trying to do the right thing in 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 the midst of all this corruption. Yeah, I, I think that's it's funny because I'm watching this film and I'm trying to think, okay, how is this movie not simply an homage to those great 70s films? And I guess because he's neither a gangster nor a cop, he's 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 a, a working Joe who's who's trying to better himself and mm-hmm. and has has done so. I mean, you know, look at that great camel hair coat he wears in pretty much every scene <laughs> yeah. in the movie. I mean, you know, you don't you don't get that by uh, by being a stooge. So yeah, totally. Uh, and and I think that's that's what sets it apart. It's ra- rather than glorify you know superhero cops or or you know down and dirty gangsters. It's about one guy who's determined to stick to his principles no matter what. And um, you know, and that's a little different than what we saw in those seventies movies. True. That 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 it's it's about an ordinary guy who's who's uh, determined to get ahead his way, and uh, and the, you know the, the cops and the, and the gangsters are kind of on the sidelines. Usually, you use, that's what the film is about. It's either one or the other, mm-hmm. pretty much. And uh, in this case, it's um, you know it's it plays it down the middle, and and I think that's what makes it fresh. In, in this case, a, a movie from our time about the past as opposed to, you know, just kind of glorifying that period and trying to recreate what we've already seen before. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's, you're, you're, you're right. That's what makes it pretty cool. At the same time, in the film, uh, David Oyelowo plays the DA who is also under a lot of pressure to try and clean up this particular industry, the oil, oil, heating oil industry, but uh, uh, not to be too spoilerific here, but he, you know, it, his, whether he's really on the straight and narrow is, is in question by the end of the film. Yeah, there's a, there's a great, uh, great kind of, um, I don't want to say twist, but certainly a, an embellishment to his story as the film goes along. And, uh, you know, the, the, that aspect of things, whereas, you know, 
Oscar Isaac's character is, is under investigation, but he seems to be the most straight up guy of the whole industry. But he's, I, I guess that makes him the easiest target in, uh, by the same token. So, you know, and it, he's got to live with the past of this company and the family that went before him. So, um, you know, he's definitely between a rock and a hard place with, yeah. you know, trying to do the right thing and just seems to get her in, into more and more trouble, especially when other people take the incentive to try and defend themselves and then make up their own rules and it doesn't uh, doesn't quite go as planned. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, though he has lots of help uh, on his side by, uh, I was it was great to see Albert Brooks again in a role that was really meaty as his lawyer. I thought that was really cool. Um, you know, in fact, I think the only marked criticism I could have about a, a very violent year is its title. Uh, I, it's actually more like a very violent month. He has thirty <laughs> days. He has thirty days to get the money together to buy this property by the East River, and and that drives a lot of the suspense of the film. Uh, and you know, he never he basically almost never takes off that camel hair coat. It's it's a wintry movie. It's the end of nineteen eighty one. It's it's a it's a rough time. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that confused a lot of people. I think a lot of people thought it was going to be like Goodfellas, mm-hmm. you know, and, and and that sort of thing. Whereas it's it's really just referring to the time in which it took place when when New York reached the breaking point, basically, and then things started to turn around. You know, yeah. move towards the disinfication of Times Square and you know the 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 broken windows rules or whatever you know that were cleaning up neighborhoods and stuff like that. Um, you know, I remember we when I, we took a wrong turn on that trip or maybe one of, the, one of the subsequent ones and drove through the highway that goes through the Bronx and just saw all these buildings that were nobody living in them and no windows and just uh, you know I'd never seen urban decay like that before and you know and clearly that was a big part of uh, of what this period was about about yeah. trying to turn things around which yeah. which they have in a lot of ways to the point where People, most people can't afford to live there anymore. Yeah, but. it's true. It's kind of like the double-edged sword. You know, it's um, it may be much safer now than it's ever been in the last fifty years. But uh, but then, who can afford to live in Manhattan? I wanted to bring us back to the mentioning Serpico, uh, which we which I referenced earlier. Um, you know, Sidney Lumet was one of the great directors of the era and he, uh, Prince of the City and these kinds of movies uh, about cops and, and about uh, what was happening in the city at the time. And, and Serpico is based on a true story about a, a cop who, who really wanted to do the right thing. And uh, he was constantly foiled by his own colleagues. And when he brought he brought his concerns about corruption, about cops on the take to his bosses, they basically brushed him off as much as they possibly could. And, and it, it got to be that not only was his life in danger from from criminals, uh, his actual his uh, fellow cops were were sort of setting him up and and uh, you know threatening him and and uh, basically saying you know if you can't be one of us then you shouldn't be here uh, and I and in terms of of the things that I look for in a great New York movie this has it in spades uh, he starts as a as a, <laughs> a uniform cop in uh, in Brooklyn. And then uh, he wants a transfer because the the division he's in is so you know miserable. So he he goes to the Bronx, then Manhattan, and eventually back to Brooklyn in Vice. So right. it's like he you get to see different parts of the city and and a lot of the sort of great sort of tenement stuff like these buildings that on the inside at the time were completely derelict and dirty and and falling down. But I think to myself now they would all be cleaned up and probably you know condos. <laughs> Probably are right now. Yeah, yeah, and then and, and Pacino is like the perfect actor for that time. Like he's he's so much a guy of the city, but he you know he's got that kind of wounded animal quality. Yeah, I guess for lack yeah, of a better sure. term, that 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 uh, you know that there was a sensitivity to him that uh, you know elevated the whole leading. I mean, it's not an action film per se. I mean, yes, it's about a policeman, but. Um, you know that that there was that quality to his his characters that uh, you know really appealed to male and female audiences for one thing. Yeah, but, you know I think that was kind of a turning point for these kind of films and for for him in particular that it wasn't wasn't just a macho action kind of thing. For but, sure. And uh, you know I guess now we can we sort of forget what a sex symbol he was considered to be at the time. <laughs> yeah, and it's and funny because he could act his tone his voice could be kind of more high pitched. I noticed he controlled his voice a little differently than he yeah. like I thought he was very very sort of gravelly in uh, in Godfather, but here he has kind of a squeaky voice, and he's also not afraid to appear a little effeminate. And of course, that gets him in trouble in the <laughs> in his amongst his his clean cut cops who are concerned about his sexuality. Uh, but he's also this guy who realizes, and it's a bit of the counterculture in play uh, that that. Uh, 
you know, he needs to wear a mustache and he needs to dress like a normal guy because he feels like the, uh, the 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 police officers, the police in general, are completely separate from the street. They don't have any idea what's going on. I mean, he said, at one point he says, you know, the undercover cop wears black shoes and white socks. You know, they can see them from a <laughs> mile away. So how is he going to do his job if 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 he's uh, is so identifiable? Uh, and I think that's interesting too. Is like the the wardrobe is is very indicative of of like how how he was his character was changing as he tried to do his job and the people around him weren't open to change. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I really enjoyed the film. It's a bit rambly, but it sure shows a lot of, it feels like a docudrama at times. Yeah. And the nice thing was that films could be a little looser at that time that they didn't have to, you know, follow the three act storyline or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, they just kind of have more of a shaggy dog thing that eventually takes you to, to where it goes. I mean, it was based on a true story, so it's kind of tied to, to what happened in a lot of ways. But um, and and he does that sort of guy against the system thing so well. You know, you think of Injustice for All as another example, where yeah. you know, you you know, the, the, this whole court is out of order, and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, and you know, yeah. and unfortunately, I think that film kind of marks the point where Pacino starts to go into self parody a little yes. bit. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Scent of a Woman is kind of where that reaches its apex. I think yeah, with that, yeah. that and, and he finally won, earns care. an Academy Award, but I think it was one of those body of work more Academy Awards. Yeah, you know? but then we see him in stuff like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and we're like, okay, come on Al, yeah. <laughs> do another good film. Yeah, totally. Don't, don't make another Devil's Advocate, please. Um, I also wanted to mention the interesting supporting roles in, in Lumet's film. Uh, keep your eyes open, Judd Hirsch is a is a cop on the beat in one moment, and F. Murray Abraham is in it. Uh, and then one of, the, one of the cleaner cops, played by uh, an actor who you just don't... I, I immediately associate with New York films of the 70s as Tony Roberts, who, of course, <laughs> showed up in a couple of Woody Allen movies. More than a couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Always, I'm always hard-pressed to think of anything he did besides uh, besides Woody Allen yeah. movies. Yeah, well, there you go. He was in this. It, well, that's the other thing about those films. I mean, it, they're such great casts because they have that, that Broadway um, cadre to draw from. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I think of Jeff Goldblum showing up as one of the punks in one of the Death Wish movies. That's right, yeah. Which is really hard to imagine. But, yeah. but it happened. Yeah, know? and he was uh, he got a big break for Woody Allen as well in uh, in Annie Hall. Oh, that's he had, right. Like one line that uh, that I've I've forgotten my mantra. I think <laughs> <laughs> um, this might be uh, a good time to talk about Woody because he's you can't. I mean, he's so associated with New York City. That guy just has and he made a bunch of great films uh, that that really you know really drew the. The, the certain part of the city, I guess the Upper West Side or Upper East Side of the city that, that he, you know, his, his neighborhood. Yeah, it's a very specific view of New York in a lot of ways uh, from his sort of humble Brooklyn beginnings. And then you're right, the more Tony Upper upper West Side kind of kind of lifestyle. Um, and it's something he sort of built gradually, too. If you, like, like, I mean, he had films that were set in New York prior to that. But it really, really with Annie Hall, it was just like, you know that it kind of became a bigger part of what he did and it was using the city as his broader canvas i mean manhattan obviously yeah um you know is, is maybe the ultimate love letter to the city I'm yeah i think left. so well when you compare it with that great the gorgeous cinematography and then uh and then the music you know uh it's just yeah i i have really fondness not necessarily for the script but but when you talk about woody allen movies that really feel like something where there is where is where all the cinematic elements are really working i think manhattan has has a really has has a special place for me and it, you know going a little deeper i guess radio days is one i think of where he's not actually in it but i think you hear his voice on the radio perhaps at some point in the in the in the film but but you know that that tells us kind of the smaller more intimate sort of stories about uh growing up in in Brooklyn. Although I always think about, uh, I think it's Annie Hall, where his family's living under one of the, the Coney, Coney Island, Island roller coasters. <laughs> roller coaster, yeah. <laughs> you know? And the first time I went yeah. to Coney Island, I was half expecting to see like a little house yeah. under the cyclone. But of course, yeah. it was not, not to be, sadly. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you know, and I, he, of course, he continued to make New York movies through his career. And uh, the, one of the, my favorites of his is uh, is through his 90s period, which I think for some is considered, you know, his fallow era where people weren't paying as much attention to him because his you know private life was all over the tabloids. Uh, but he made a musical uh Everyone says I love you. Oh yeah, that's a fun which film. is such a fun movie, and uh, and you know it's it's definitely his milieu. The the wealthy 
uh, New Yorkers in Manhattan, but he fills it full of these sta- these songs, and he gets a bunch of non singer actors to sing, and and I think that's part of what's so joyous about it is is that there's a sense of of uh, enthusiasm, uh, not only for the city but for material which is which are standards, and everyone loves these songs, uh, and even when Ed- Edward Norton sings it. <laughs> well, the, the nice thing about that film is they're singing with the real voices, and uh, you know they're not pushing it, they're not trying to sound like professional singers and and the, so that the character comes through in the voice and that's that's unusual for musicals you don't i mean i'm i'm trying to think of a, a similar feel i mean so many of the classic hollywood musicals most unless it's judy garland most of the stars are dubbed by uh, other professional singers so yeah. it's, you know you don't really get a, a sense of, of the you know they have to kind of approximate the character that the actor's playing um umbrellas of cherbourg came to mind mm-hmm. as, as in a, of course that's non-stop singing i don't think there's any spoken dialogue in that film right and and the actors are singing but they're kind of doing it in their own voices and it's not meant to sound like marnie nixon and the king and i or whatever right. you, you know yeah. it's not meant to sound perfect and uh and then that film remind and the woody film reminded me of that of yes. just like you know let's just try and make it charming and light and and uh, you know we don't have to worry about these people's uh, singing abilities too much. Yeah, no, I know absolutely, and and you know, and then there's all these again the New York movies. There's a great exteriors. There's these wonderful moments uh, near the Plaza Hotel, and and you just get a you, you know maybe some of the things. I've never been to uh, New York during a blizzard like in the midwinter. Uh, I did go once for Christmas, but uh, but the weather was great as it happens. Uh, but then there's a, there's a shot from the opening montage of Manhattan that you see like taxis driving through the blinding you know snow and I think wow wouldn't that be something to be in a city like that in the middle of a blizzard anyway it was um, it was, it was winter when I was there in seventy eight or seventy nine and uh, it was pretty grungy as I recall yeah. like it was just crusty gray snow on the side of the roads and I, my my uncle took us to a drive through Manhattan in his van. And the, the you know the highlight was like seeing F A O Schwartz, the biggest toy store in the world, and then being told that I could not go inside. <laughs> I just felt crushed. Oh no! Just, why not? Like, because we had well, a I'd like, they'd lose me. Oh, right, <laughs> they'd have to yeah. find me. Yeah. Um, and you know, like the, I already had my Christmas presents, so I guess it wasn't go. anymore. And and, <laughs> and uh, you know, we were on a schedule. Ah. <laughs> I guess you know nobody wanted to stay in Manhattan too too long. Fair enough. You know, we had to get to Chinatown. So you know, I saw the whole. You know, I'm like, again, I'm like. 11 or 12 at this point just seeing Manhattan whizzing by a, uh-huh. a van window as a kid, just all these places that I'd heard about and seen in movies is pretty pretty fantastic at a time when the city was not at its best I mean you know yeah. 42nd Street was was still had the grindhouse cinemas showing you know X-rated movies sure. and that kind of thing but it was you know it was all pretty exotic to me as far yeah. as I'm concerned I, I guess that uh, brings up the question but why you know why this obsession with New York City you know why aren't there more movies set in Pittsburgh or you know or or Baltimore. I mean, obviously we got John Waters down there, but but you know clearly this is a, an ongoing obsession with the city. You know, you know if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, so to speak. Um, and uh, you know, obviously this is something that films have been doing for. You know, we've only gone back to the '70s so far, but clearly this is a, you know, New York City has been a, a financial and social and cultural center for you know yeah. over you know centuries. Yeah, and people like us who grew up on these movies, uh, who are making movies, are wanting to do them there, you know? Like, I'm sure J.C. Chandor is probably... He, I think he's actually younger than we are. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and he's he's like, you know, I want to make my, my New York movie, you know? It's, uh, I mean, it, it's funny. I, I think part of it goes back to, like, the, you know, when... Edison or whoever, like, you know, when they put in the first uh, elevated train and they, they would just put a camera on the train and take you on a train trip through uh, through New York or whatever, and then that film would be shown all over the country to people mm-hmm. who had never been to New York, had only seen photographs, and, uh, you know, th- that sparked this fascination that lives on to this day because it's just, you know, such a, you know, everything, you know, at that time, all the music came from there. At one point, that's where all the movies came from before people started relocating to the West Coast. Um and uh, so, the, and for a long time, even even though the studios were in Hollywood, the head offices were in New York. So right. there's that uh, you know sort of balance between having a bit of both, and uh, you know it just seems like it's it's you, you feel like you haven't lived if you haven't been there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know? And uh, you know even if you've only been able to go there and film, um, but it feels like something everybody should do at least once in their in their lifetime. Uh, and it's this, yeah, it's this thing that just kind of gets into your blood. I mean. I, we were talking about the Saturday Night Live 40th anniversary thing. And they did a whole segment on, you know, 
how the show used New York over the years. Mm-hmm, as a character. And, yeah, as a character. And of course, people on Twitter were joking. He's like, I get it. New York is a character. Can we move on? <laughs> and it is, you know, in a way, it is kind of a cliche, you know, saying the city is a character. And, and I would love to see more movies set in other places. You know, I'm a big Chicago fan, for sure. example. Um, but, you know, but still, you know, even though, and, and if given a choice, I probably would, you know, given a choice between New York or Chicago, I probably would live in Chicago over New York. But but I still, you know, would, you know, if I know a movie set there, that's an instant hook right there. I don't even care what it's about. Yeah. Uh, yeah I will watch enough. it, you know. And, Fair enough, you know. Um, and... Uh... Yeah, I I really I I love those 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 sort of overhead camera shots. You know, I love I love the <laughs> skyline, uh, and uh, you know we. <laughs> I think this might be a nice moment to segue to cue the winged yes, serpent. I, I felt you going there. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, cue the winged serpent is directed by Larry Cohen, who's had an amazing career as a director, but especially as a writer. Uh, and and this was his 1982 offering, which he wrote and directed, and uh, it stars. I think the main star is Michael Moriarty, really. He's Pretty doing, much. He's like the guy who's on screen most of all. He's the guy we sort of sympathize with. Sort yeah, of. sort of. And he <laughs> plays uh, Jimmy Quinn, who's kind of a, a low-level, uh, fast-talking, smooth operator. I mean, he kind of wants to be a... a big man but he just talks a good talk <laughs> and uh he's yeah, a bit psychotic a bit too. psychotic he gets into trouble with some some bad folks and a, a a robbery that goes wrong and and somehow winds up in the uh in the in the roof of the chrysler building uh where he makes an interesting discovery there's there's a, a creature up there a giant ancient aztec lizard that <laughs> flies over chicago <laughs> over new york uh randomly grabbing people off the tops of buildings and decapitating window washer people and all that sort of thing. And I guess, we should point out, this is the letter Q, which is short for Quetzalcoatl, which is the name of this ancient uh, South American lizard. Uh, and not like, it's not like saying, Q the winged serpent, like winged serpent, you're on next. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. In fact, I think Q, the actual official title is just Q. The winged serpent was something that was maybe added during the Yeah, well, the original or posters something. just had a Q in the shape of a, of a, of a lizard yeah. uh, on, the, on the thing. <laughs> You're going out there a lizard, and you're coming back a star. <laughs> um, but it's yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've seen this film a number of times now, and I, I keep going back to it because it's just, it's 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 one of my favorite New York movies that most people probably haven't seen, and it's. But it just makes such great use of the city. There's a lot of aerial photography. At one point, they show the lizard kind of flying between the twin towers, which is kind of creepy in a yeah, way. Yeah, I think, I think there's maybe 10 or 15 minutes of just aerial photography yeah. of various parts of the city. And I mean, that's awesome, especially at that era to see how it's changed since then, new buildings. And uh, and uh, yeah, David Carradine is in it. He plays a cop named Shepard and his partner is Richard Roundtree. Roundtree? Shaft? Yeah, no, yeah. A named, cop. Uh, named Powell. And uh, basically it's there trying to figure out who how all these people are dying uh, and who's killing all these folks, decapitating them, disemboweling all these folks. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Michael Moriarty has he he knows who's doing it, and he he's got the goods. So he goes to the cops and basically says, "I want a million bucks, and I will give you this creature. I can tell you where it is." And uh, yeah, there's a great scene <laughs> where he just basically makes his demands uh, of of the cops. And uh, meanwhile, his girlfriend uh, Candy Clark is uh, is sort of putting up with his his crazy uh, you know attitude. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's uh, Moriarty's a lot of fun in the movie, and the film itself is it's a great monster movie. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, uh, no bones about it. It's a low budget movie. That's why they, you know they they rented that helicopter for the day, and darn it, they're going to get the most out of that footage. And that's why we see so much of that aerial footage throughout the course of the film. But hey, it's good production value, and and the story doesn't always make sense. There's there's also a subplot about uh, an Aztec cult ritual sacrifice dude who's never really fully explained um, what the connection is between him and Quetzalcoatl just mysteriously appearing in the top of the Chrysler building and flying over New York. And and, and also the cops seem pretty lackadaisical about <laughs> solving these deaths. They there's no, not a lot of urgency in their investigation I have to say. You know, the, the, and, uh, you know, the, you know the, when when um, uh, Michael Moriarty is describing, you know, he, I mean, David Carradine tries to get it out of him fairly cleverly, and he still takes a while to clue in as to what he's talking about. It's like it's a building; it's shaped like a cone on the top, and <laughs> like that pretty much narrows it down. I would yeah. think, but uh, yeah, but but it's it's a lot of fun. It's done in the right spirit. Larry Cohen um, made a lot of great B pictures through the seventies and eighties. He's still around. If you, if you want to see him, he's on the uh, Trailers from Hell website. He often hosts uh, 
uh, and does commentary for trailers for his own movies and also some of his favorites. But his scripts are notoriously smart and uh, you know laden with lots of literary references and 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 uh, references to culture and history and that sort of thing. Like he did um, he did some black exploitation films, um, Black Caesar, and then the sequel Hell Up in Harlem. And it really was structured like a Shakespearean play, but it was set in uh, the Harlem gangland world. Um, and with the, with a great James Brown soundtrack, so it's you know there's there's another one worth tracking down. You know the the films are a lot smarter than they have any right to be in a lot of ways. The stuff is another one he did about mm-hmm. sort of a a killer yogurt that turns people into zombies. I think it's been a long time since <laughs> yeah. I've seen that one. <laughs> yeah. But but you know any, anything that has his name on it as a as a writer or director or both is really worth seeking out. Yeah. And most of them are set in New York City. You know he just has a real fondness for for doing stuff there. <laughs> Um, I think I want to mention too, uh, in terms of beloved New York, New York City stories, New York City movies, uh, is one by Paul Mazursky, and this is one I saw way too young. Like I shouldn't, I probably <laughs> shouldn't have seen it at the year, at the age I saw it. Uh, it's from 1978, and it's called An Unmarried Woman, and it really laid, like I, it sort of. Uh, allowed me to understand the problems like re- what divorce meant because I my parents were fortunately uh, you know still together and and uh, uh, and I didn't know a lot at the time a lot of kids whose parents were divorced but this was a movie about divorce and it's the kind of movie they don't they I mean you know you hear it all the time the cliche of they don't really make these like this anymore but it, it is a real time capsule of a uh, political movement in some ways and that's the women coming into their own and feeling a sense of agency about their lives and uh, basically Jill Clay plays an Upper East Side uh, woman whose husband uh, cheats on her and leaves her for a, uh, a younger woman who's and he's been cheating on her for, for for ages when she finally discovers it and they have a they have a teenage daughter together and live in this amazing apartment overlooking the East River the opening shot is another one of those aerial shots that comes up the East River while she's jogging. And so basically from the 59th Street Bridge all the way up and you just follow it right down to, to where she's jogging there and her husband joins her and, and uh, they seem to have a great relationship. She seems very happy, but she's she's probably in her late 30s. And I thought about it. If they've been married long enough to have a kid who was in their teens, she probably got married in the early 60s. So if you can imagine, she hasn't been single <laughs> right. from the early 60s to the late 70s and how much change happened in that period. So basically, I mean, at first she is shocked and upset and, and distraught and seeing a therapist and doing... Doing all those kinds of things as, as one did in the in the seventies when you know taking a, taking control of your life, uh, and then she decides that she needs to get out a little bit and date. And she has some she has a group of, of female friends that give her advice in, in this regard. It's kind of like a proto uh, Sex in the City. Uh, these four women, uh, though some of them are quite cynical about their their life choices and about life as as a single woman or even a married woman in in New York. And uh yeah, and she meets Alan Bates who's an artist down in Soho and then they start a relationship and and uh, anyway, I I just I really I've watched it again recently and it really holds up not only as drama but as as just sort of looking at what uh, the changes in American society in New York uh, specifically were going through at the time. Yeah, well, of course, you know, it had a reputation as one of the most progressive cities. In uh, in the world, but at the same time, a lot of people there are very stuck in tradition and and stuck in the past. Or you know, you think of neighborhoods like the Hasidic neighborhoods where they're living the same life that they were living a hundred years ago, or as close to it as they can get. And 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 uh, you know, so so it's a city of contradictions. And I, I think that film probably reflects that really well. I'm not as familiar with uh, an unmarried woman as I should be. And uh, you know, it's it's kind of it's kind of a shame Jill Clayburgh didn't really have the kind of career that she probably should have had based on the success of that film and the popularity of uh, of her performance in it. Um, you know, I I think of Mazursky. Uh, it's funny I, when I think of him, I think of him as a Hollywood guy. Like, um, you know, I think of Down and Out in Beverly Hills. Mm-hmm, he made fair. a pretty dreadful movie about a director called The Pickle. Oh uh, yes, with. Uh, Oh, uh, now I'm forgetting the name. But anyway, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, Alex in Wonderland is an early film of his with uh, Donald Sutherland as a kind of a, a hippie director who uh, is trying to make his uh, a follow-up to a big smash and can't decide what to do, sort of like Fellini's Eight and a Half. It's all set in Hollywood. Um, and Fellini actually makes an appearance in the film as himself, which is pretty remarkable oh, yeah, when you consider something. it. Uh, and, wait a second, was the pickle is Danny Aiello? That's it, Danny Aiello. All right, I was right. I was thinking of uh, Sor- Paul Sorvino, so. right? <laughs> but I knew that <laughs> Italian American actor, sure. exactly. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. all blend together. <laughs> but um, 
uh, you know, so so all my references were for Hollywood. But then, uh, you know, you mentioned Unmarried Woman when we started talking about this uh, this particular topic. And then uh, the film he made before this was called Next Stop Greenwich Village, which is basically an autobiographical story of his young days as an actor. Because that's oh, when yeah. he, he started out as an actor. Right, right. Uh, uh, for, for many years, most famously, I think he was in... Um, I think it may have been Blackboard Jungle, mm-hmm. perhaps, playing one of the juvenile delinquents. But, but um, you know, in later years, uh, once the film actually came out, uh, he was better, almost as better known for acting as being in Stanley Kubrick's first feature, Fear and Desire. Aha, right. the one The one he disowned, basically. Right, yeah, <laughs> Because yeah. It, he thought it was... Uh, Amateurish balderdash, I think, is what okay. he just, when when somebody wanted to show a copy while Kubrick was still alive, he basically would not give permission because he owned right. the film. It was right. he produced it and directed it himself, mm-hmm. and then after a few uh, a, a few uh, appearances here and there, immediately locked it away. And uh, you know, at, at the time, for good reason, it's not very good. But and Mazursky wildly overacts in the film. Uh, and I think everybody's post dubbed, which gives it a really bizarre feel. But, um, you know, so I think directing was probably the right choice for him. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but next stop Greenwich village basically talks about those early days when he was like trying to make it on the stage and get into films. Uh, and is there, is there a Kubrick character in the movie? Cause I haven't seen that one. Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think it really gets, it's more about being a stage actor. Okay. I think. And, enough. uh, his best pal is played by Christopher Walken. Uh, uh-huh. and it's one of those great early Christopher Walken films that most yes. people haven't seen. There's a, um, the Anderson tapes, tapes with Sean yes, Connery is sure. another one. There's all these yeah, that's great, another good New York movie. Yeah, too. Uh, there's one called Roseland where he basically plays like a dancehall gigolo. Like all these great early, you know, pre Deer Hunter basically because yes. Deer Hunter kind of turned everything around and yeah. made him a star. Yeah, and Woody Allen has also had a had a role in that. In Annie oh, that's Hall, right, of he course, played Dwayne. Dwayne Hall, who, <laughs> who wants to drive his car into the oncoming lights, <laughs> staring into the headlights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think if we're going to talk about New York movies that we have to mention uh, Scorsese here. I think he's kind Ooh. of like the <laughs> he's he's kind of the you know this the the saint of of New York movies in some ways. I I, I mean I I probably Taxi Driver is probably my favorite of his if you took his entire body of work. But I have another favorite. I'm just wondering uh, before I mention that, Stephen, do you have one that you like to see that that you revisit of Scorsese? Yeah. Um... Well, I love Taxi Driver. You know, I, mm. I remember, you know, and, and that was one of those films that had a big build up because, uh, you know, like in the pre, before people even had VCRs, I'd, I'd heard of this film and how it was like really intense and terrifying. And, and it kind of really built up in my psyche before I finally got around to watching it, probably on VHS or something. And uh, it kind of lived up to my expectations, which is unusual. Most films, you know, if a film builds up in your imagination that long, and that one really did. But but I have a real love for Mean Streets, yes. uh, which which came before that. Um, just uh, the, the two kind of lower echelon hoods played by Harvey Keitel and, and Robert De Niro. I, I just love the relationship between them and the way they interact with the other guys in the neighborhood. I love the pool hall fight, you know, where they, you know, where they call it. The other guy's mooks, and they just, <laughs> yeah, they're like they don't even know what that word means, and they just, yeah. they just know it's a pejorative. <laughs> and, and, and this really awkward, grapply kind of fight breaks out, which is, looks exactly like a real fight, as opposed to like you know two fisted John Wayne type fights. It actually looks like a real fight where not a lot of damage gets done. People just kind of grapple and uh-huh. and, and and wriggle around on the floor, or whatever, and maybe get a few kicks in. But um, it's just and the film just has that great low budget kind of. Uh, gritty feel to it. I, I don't want to use the word gritty. I was, hoping, I was going to maybe have a gritty counter on the wall to see how many times it pops up <laughs> over the course of the podcast. But you can't really avoid it. With but with that film, I mean, I mean, like you really, you can see the film grain in that thing when you watch it on, yeah, you know, on your chosen format. And uh, uh, it's you know that that to me is really captures the spirit of like the New York that he grew up mm-hmm. with and the kind of guys that he ran around with. And Goodfellas kind of does the same thing on a bigger scale, yeah, on a more operatic scale. Um, but I feel like those are probably people that he saw, you know, off in the distance as opposed to Mean Streets, which feels like the people that he would interact with on a day-to-day basis sure. as, a, you know, growing up or whatever. Well, I think, I think uh, it, it, with that in mind, I think the movie I wanted to mention is After Hours from 1985, oh, yeah. which uh, strikes me as the people he met once he got successful, you know, like the, <laughs> yeah. the money people, uh, you know, and the and nut he, bars, the nut bars. <laughs> and he, he meets, uh, and, and maybe at the galleries and all the art shows that he was invited to go to, uh, Griffin Dunn playing this guy who gets stuck in Soho and after, after hours, you know, and he can't get home and, uh, he has no money. His money has gone away and it's, and so he can't, you know, it, it, and it, it occurred to me at the time, uh, 
you know, how does that happen? How do you, in a city like New York, where transit is so available, how do you get stuck in one part of the city? But the the script is so wonderfully, uh, there's so these overlapping characters and strange things going on. It's quite hallucinate, hallucinatory, uh, and uh, and it's also a great uh, '80s movie in some ways. Like it it takes that New York thing and and it adds all the money and all the sort of superficiality and all those bad like suits with the uh you know <laughs> with the big shoulders on them and you just think to myself it's like it's it's the transfer it's a transference from the uh, as the grit from the 70s to something else that, yeah that's kind of un uh, it's made me uneasy a bit watching more neon and it. yes and unpleasant slime i uh, well oddly enough the thing that reminded me about uh, was a trip to new york that i made in 88 with um it's, it's a long convoluted story but some people i worked with we went on like a trip that was paid for by work uh, to New York. It was a tourist travel kind of thing. And uh, we had some free time to kind of wander around the city, especially at night. And, but there were like entire neighborhoods in Manhattan that just kind of shut down. Like they're either business neighborhoods or whatever that, had, you know, after dark, uh, really just, you know, that nobody lived there. The mm-hmm. businesses were closed and they were kind of really eerie, like these weird urban ghost towns. It really, like another film, you know, it was kind of like Escape from New York. There you go. <laughs> to mention another film that we haven't really talked about at all, but... Um, and, uh, you know, that's the kind of feel it had, you know, and if you saw another person, you were kind of like, well, what's that guy doing here? And they'd probably looking at you going, what are those guys doing here? <laughs> you know, like, oh, well, you know, you definitely feel like you're in the wrong part of town, even though in daytime, it's probably very busy and filled with people. Mm-hmm. Um, now that was in 88. I, things could be different now, given the way real estate and business is. But, yeah. but it was very weird to be walking down these, you know, blocks and blocks where there was nobody around and all the lights were out and it was... You know, because we were just kind of wandering willy nilly, without sure. really knowing where we were going, and it's very creepy. It it can be, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and you know, the now people do live, and I guess they still did. You know, the the art some artists could afford to live in in Soho at the time, and uh, I guess only the very wealthy ones can now. But there's there's a great scene with Rosanna Arquette and Linda Fiorentino are up in this this loft space in uh, in Soho, and uh, and there's like sculptures everywhere, and and uh, it's all just. It's all just a little peculiar and and uh, unsettling, um, but uh, but you know actually the last time I went to New York City, um, which was last September, I. I treated myself to a screening of After Hours before I went, just to sort of remind myself of what, what the city could be like, what it might still be like in some areas. Uh, yeah, and uh, and it was, I was really happy to notice that Cheech and Chong are in it. Yes. <laughs> yes, the, the, sadly, the only time they've been able to work with Scorsese yeah. in After Hours. There you uh, go. I, f- I feel they're due for a rematch. I, I agree, totally. So I, I guess now we're getting to the point of the, the discussion, Stephen, where we talk about our favorite New York movies. I don't know if you have anything in, on the top of mind that you might like to mention that we haven't so far. Well, the first thing that came to mind uh, was the – and because we haven't really talked about a lot of classic films set in New York. And I, I thought of the musical On the Town with the, with Gene Kelly and, and Ann Miller and, and about, about – you know, three sailors on leave in New York, and it, and they made a big deal about it at the time it came out. I believe in either the late forties, early fifties, um, about you know using New York as a character, um, and uh, but but the you know just this Technicolor view of the city at hmm. you know might be its peak really, like of of when you know it was the gleaming city of Oz on, yeah. on, on the on the Atlantic, so to speak. And, uh, you know, the whole thing is filmed on location, which was, even for that time, was kind of unusual for a Hollywood film. Most of the time, they'd maybe get a couple of second unit shots and do everything else back in the studio in Los Angeles. But in On the Town, uh, they have that great, the great score and, and the, you know, the dancing on real locations, Rockefeller Center and so on. Right. And that was pretty novel at the time. Yeah. And it's a beautiful film. I mean, I just, I'm a big fan of Technicolor and and that's really one of the, the, the crowning glories of, of the format. Uh, I don't think it's on Blu-ray yet, unfortunately, but I think you can probably get it in any number of different ways, either streaming or on DVD or what have you. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know, New York, New York, it's a heck of a time. I mean, it just yeah. it filters right into the music. And, sure. You know, and, and when I saw some of those locations for the first time in person, you know, you're kind of like trying to resist the urge to go into a dance number. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fair, you know. I mean, that's what those movies do to you. Pretty much, Pretty yeah. much, yeah. Well, I, I thought also about uh, about some classic 
New York films like uh, Sweet Cell Smell Success, which has a real, uh, real, you know, you really get a sense of what the city oh, is sure. like in that. Uh, and then I also thought, uh, thought of movies that are a little more recent. Uh, Abel Ferrar as King of New York, uh, mentioning Christopher Walken, speaking of him. I mean, that's one of my favorites, too. And certainly a lot of those Woody Allen movies are inseparable from thinking about New York. But uh, at the end of the day, I had to, I had to bring it back to the 70s and uh, choose The Warriors. Oh, yes, uh, Walter Hill, uh, which a movie, again, I saw pretty young uh, the first time, and it really, I absolutely loved it. And, and you know, talk want to talk about New York as a character, you know, and, and I, I remember watching it and wanting to go and get a map so I could figure out where they were going. Basically, if you haven't seen it, it's the story of a gang from Coney Island in Brooklyn, which is like one of the southernmost points, I guess, of uh, the, the borough of Brooklyn. Well, it's literally the end of the line. Like, yeah. that is where the trains stop. Like, yeah. That, that's that's where you got to get off. And uh, and they take the long train ride all the way up to Bronx, up to the top of the, the line, uh, the beginning of it, I guess, and have a big gang meeting up there. But it goes badly, and they have to try to get back to Coney Island, and the whole city is looking for them because they are they are believed to have uh, have done something terrible, and uh, and of course they are being framed for this by by a bunch of badasses. And uh, it is, and it's all shot at night until the very last, maybe. 15 minutes of the movie uh, and it is just amazing like the 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 music the electronic score I think it may have been the first one of the first movies to have an electronic score uh, is uh, is just wonderful and uh, and just the, and the action sequences the fight sequences and then the setting setting on a lot of subway stations and uh, most of them empty uh, and, and subway tracks and then empty streets in, in rough parts of town all the way from the Bronx right down through Brooklyn is uh, uh, it's it's a movie that stands up to to frequent rewatches. I found. Yeah, even though uh, Hill has gone back and frigged with it on <laughs> for the latest uh, video release. Yeah, I think I would avoid that if you can. It's. Uh, I, don't not... if you, yeah, I don't know if you get the option of watching the original. Kind well, of this, but... there are some. No, not <clears throat> on that on that particular release. But there are some that you, you can still find the original yeah, cut oh, if you're sure. looking for it. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 wonderful. The characters are great. I mean, there are this gang of like nine of them to start with. Of course, they start getting picked off as time goes on. But but uh, a lot of a lot of great characters, yeah, and then that to me is is what is the the kind of mythical New York um, is created there. It's almost a science fiction movie. Well, that's that's about it. You can't really go wrong in some regard with movies set in New York, whether it's Jason Takes Manhattan or The Muppets Take Manhattan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I want to see Jason meets the Muppets. Now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, but, that's uh, right. And even the, even the movies like that that aren't um, actually shot in New York, like Gremlins Two, still have a great New York feeling to them. Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And you know, like the old rule says, location, location, <laughs> location. <laughs> That's our look at films set in and featuring the streets and skylines of the Big Apple. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Lens Me Your Ears is hosted by Stephen Cook and Karsten Knox and is produced in Halifax, Nova Scotia at Village Sound for the Village Soundcast Network. Lens Me Your Ears is engineered by Luke Badio and is produced by Dave Anderson and Jason Michael McIsaac. All music courtesy of Gypsophilia. Check out all of their amazing music, tour dates, and so much more at gypsophilia.org. Discover more great shows on the Village Soundcast Network by going to villagesoundcast.com. We can also be found on Twitter at VSoundcast and on Facebook by searching the Village Soundcast Network. Rate and review us on iTunes and you'll get a shout out on an upcoming show. Send feedback to Lends Me Your Ears Podcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. This was a Village Soundcast Network original production.